awake the whole time. It's about a 50 minute work. So at that age, I, I, I sometimes would fall asleep, but which is sort of uh, funny because the piece was actually written. Uh, so the, the, the story of this piece is that there is a really rich uh, uh, aristocratic, a, a duke, I guess. And he had insomnia, he couldn't sleep. So because he couldn't sleep, he wanted some music to entertain him in his in, in the early morning hours. <laughs> So basically Bach wrote this 50 minute work for harpsichord and uh, there was a young, I think a 14 or 15 year old harpsichordist who was uh, a prodigy that would play this piece for the count. Uh, and and actually uh, to, to keep him awake, I guess, or, or to, to entertain him. But needless to say though, uh, it's always been on the back of my mind, this piece, and I've always flirted with learning it until I would say back in 2017, uh, is when I decided I had a summer, about two months of a summer to kind of really spend uh, and devote myself to this work. So I decided to give it a shot and see what happens. Um, certainly, before I started learning this work, I wasn't even sure if I could play it because um, the thing that people don't always know about this work is that it was written originally for the harpsichord. And the harpsichord, mm, it's an instrument that has two manuals to it. What I mean by that is that there's two levels of, of, of playing. So the hands can actually play like this on top of each other, kind of like an organ, if, if, you, if you see the levels of the organ. Now, a piano has one plane. So that creates a lot of traffic jams for the hands. So in other variations, uh, when, when the harpsichordist will just do this, I have to be doing like this, basically, on one you know, linear plane. And so I, I, I was trying to figure out if it was even really possible for, you know, technically for me to feel comfortable playing it and to musically imbue it with what the message um, I wanted to convey. And, um, but, you know, things, things did work out with this piece and I was happy to, you know, start performing it. And, um, you know, th this is a, a live recording from a concert that I gave at the, the Colburn School, actually. Um, uh, I'm sure many of you have met Colburn students by now uh, through through uh, their travels to Naples, and um, yeah, most this is a most Michael is not here, so <laughs> he he hasn't uh, seen our live concerts yet. <laughs> oh, oh, I see. I see. Well, um, yeah, I, I mean, I guess there will be more and more uh, Colburn you know, students coming through in, in the coming the coming future. But um, yeah, no, I mean, this piece is one that I always come back to and always is refreshing for me. Um, it's definitely a desert island piece. It's a piece that I would take onto, uh, onto the desert. So uh, Bach sort of, you know, Bach was a genius. And in many ways, uh, the variation form, uh, writing variations was kind of looked down upon, actually, because it was kind of thought as lazy writing back then you know you had a melody and then you just kind of improvised upon the melody it, that was kind of thought as not compositionally sound but uh Bach kind of uh wrote the ultimate variation uh variations of all time I would say where he showed every single compositional device invention um ingenuity that could be done and um I think if I was a composer I'd be rather intimidated to write any variations following uh this this work so um Bach kind of pulled it all out of the bag. Awesome. Yeah. So, uh, Dominic, when you choose your repertoire, uh, when when you for the next concert season, so you you uh, were one of the lucky people who won a competition, our uh, Concert Artist Guild, and uh, that probably has uh, increased your concert uh, yeah. appearances. Correct. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> So when you're choosing the repertoire, how it is you're going about uh, trying to find, you know, new works or the works that you think will be compelling, you know, for different audiences? I'm sure you probably have to think about that as well, right? What market you're playing. Absolutely. You know, I mean, it, it all depends. You know, there are certain programs that, um, you know, a presenter might request that are, you know, out of the box because they have a specific audience that they're trying to cater to. Um, but per primarily though, I, I, for me, I do find that, um, I start most of my programming ideas with sort of an overlying theme or message that I want to convey. Um, so for example, I have a, a program that I am planning for, um, I, I guess a year from now that it basically compares and contrasts jazz music with classical music. So there's actually a lot of different, um, I grew up listening to a lot of jazz. My dad was an amateur jazz saxophone player. So this has been a music that's been in my life for a long time now. And I find, you know, playing the music of Beethoven, Chopin, even Bach, 
I find a lot of influences uh, that jazz musicians took from this music, whether it's bass lines, whether it's, uh, there are moments in uh, Beethoven where he has this sort of pizzicato, uh, pizzicato means plucked bass line in the piano. And it just reminds me of like a walking bass line in a jazz tune. So um, I have this program where I kind of have first half of classical selections and the second half of jazz selections. And I talk and I show people that actually the mu this music's not so dissimilar. Um, so th that's just one I you know one of the programs that I'm planning, um, but primarily I would say that there are pieces that I do love, and then um, I study them. I figure out the backstory, why they were written, the meaning of the of the piece uh, from the composer's perspective, and that, that oftentimes will give me ideas on how to connect uh, different programs together, because um, I'm not a huge fan of just necessarily playing music um, that doesn't necessarily always relate to each other. Um, I, I always like to sort of have some kind of um, theme where I can I can show composers in similar and dissimilar ways. Uh, another very fun program is to do sonatas through the years, where you play sonatas by Haydn, Beethoven, um, Strauss, uh, Carl Vine, Samuel Barber, and you show how the sonata form has really developed. And for some people, they don't like how the sonata form is developed. They prefer Beethoven sonatas, and I can't blame them. I mean, they are phenomenal. Um, and then other people say, well, you know, I, I kind of like what the modern composers are doing with the sonata form, how they're treating it. So um, I, I think if, uh, you know, a program sparks, you know, any kind of thought or discussion, I think that's my ultimate goal at the end of the day. Um, and of course, everything I'm playing is stuff that I love. I wouldn't play it otherwise. So, uh, awesome. Have you played Carl Vine, uh, Vine's music? Yeah. Oh, yes. I, I play um, his first sonata quite a bit. That's a staple of my repertoire. Uh, I would say, um, it, so Carl Vine is actually a, uh, an Australian composer who's still alive. Uh, he um, wrote a lot of film music, a lot of TV music, and also um, wrote wonderful selections for piano orchestra and other classical combinations. And he wrote a fabulous uh, sonata in 1990. In, in titled piano sonata number one and uh it couldn't be more different than the traditional piano sonata that you might have heard at naples the beethoven cycle that we've been doing and it, it's it, it's sort of this uh jazzy uh coloristic um journey actually it, it for me it's very also uh, you know rhythmically uh centered so in other words he's obsessed with rhythm and uh it, it, in some ways it becomes very visceral when you feel the rhythm pulsing over and over again and that's a, a huge um, feature of his music, I would say. In Beethoven and Mozart, you know, melody becomes much more important. Harmony is very important. Um, and, and all these things are more uh, interconnected. In, in Carl Vine's music, it's, it's harmony, color, but the rhythm, I find, is, is driving the piece uh, in a ferocious way, actually, to the, to the, to the ending. Um, so do you have any? Do you have any recordings of that? Uh, oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you can check it out on my my YouTube channel. Um, there's okay. actually a few different recordings I, I've done. I I like to um, on my YouTube. I, if I record a piece and I like it, I'll upload it. Uh, so you might find three, four different versions of it because every day is a bit different. And there's certain things that I like on certain mm -hmm. days. There's other things I like on other days. And if I'm in, you know, I also listen to my own stuff sometimes just for fun. So if I'm in a certain mood, I might pick this one or pick that one. So, um, but yeah, I, I, I urge everyone to check out Carl Vine's, not, not, my, not necessarily my recording, but Carl Vine, uh, his last name is spelled E-I-N-E, -E, Vine. He's a wonderful composer. No, awesome. Uh, you're actually, I think you're an exception in, in music, uh, well, in, for musicians uh, to be... Uh, willing to put recordings from different times and you know and even if they're not you know 100 percent perfect you know you're totally happy to put it out there and and share it with people and i i sometimes i have a difficult time with the, well with myself i mean i don't have to go far <laughs> to just say you know, sure. it's okay to put a recording with one wrong note <laughs> there's <Yeah>. not <laughs> You know, I, I was talking to um, a jazz pianist, uh, a wonderful jazz pianist. His name's Dan Tepfer. And he actually, he also plays the Goldberg Variations. He, he has a, a sort of a jazzy version he does of the piece. Um, but I was talking to him, uh, because as a jazz pianist, he records a lot. He records in improvisations, he records, you know, solos like that. And I was asking, you know, at what point do you say an improvisation is done? You know, and you move on to the next track of recording. Because 
theoretically, um, an improvisation is a spur of the moment and you always are going to regret something you did. You know, you can never do it quite right. And then by the 10th time that you've improvised, it almost becomes a composition at that point because, because you're thinking about all these different things that you're going to put in. It's not as spontaneous. So uh, as a jazz pianist, Dan was saying that for him, sometimes if it's good enough, he just moves on. And, you know, that, that's a good philosophy in many ways because... <laughs> I, honestly, um, when something's good enough and it doesn't, you know, doesn't offend me, uh, uh, then you know it, it probably is pretty decent and it's worth listening to. Perhaps certainly, if I made a like a, a commercial, you know, serious, uh, well, they're all serious, but a commercial recording that you know was edited and produced and um, was not a live performance, that would probably I would probably try to get you to put that as a first option or something, you know, in the search results. But, you know, when something's a live performance, I do think the beauty of live performance is in the moment and what's happening there. And there is a magic that is lost uh, in the studio sometimes when you, when you don't have that, that nervous energy on stage and you don't have um, all the X factors of what could happen uh, during a live performance. But, um, yeah, I think every performance has some merits to it. Well, uh, speaking of live performance, now live performance has a different meaning, right? Because we, uh, there is quite a, quite a bit of live streaming, uh, but not necessarily you don't get that energy, the feel from the audience. How, how has it been? I know you've done a few of those already. How does it feel? You know, in some ways... Um, I'm actually fascinated by it because I do enjoy it, actually. I, I, um, it's different. I mean, I, I think preferably we have a live audience in, in, in attendance, but there's also something to be said for um, the sensation that one feels when you really are alone. And um, I think in some ways you can access different parts of yourself when you're alone and you kind of enter into your own zone. It sometimes... Um, you know, when you're practicing, when, when I'm, I'm sure you know, Milana, uh, when you're practicing, it's very easy to sort of enter into a zone where you're not really thinking about the external world. You're all alone. You're in your 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 home. Also, for for us, we're playing on our piano, which is really nice uh, in the sense that we don't have to be kind of uh, playing on some random piano that we're given that day. Granted, in Naples, we're given you know, nominal fazioli. So it, <laughs> most of the time, you know, I, I was marveling at how. You know, when I'm playing on my piano over here, uh, it's it's nice because I know how it works. I know what works, you know, what doesn't work and how to sort of make it sound better. Um, and that comfort can sometimes come through in the performances that I'm giving online. So in some ways, I do really enjoy that. Um, but I, I certainly do look forward to uh, performing live again uh, whenever things are safe. Because that, that Nothing replaces that. But I find this to be a fascinating substitute actually good point really uh, as as artists you know i i teach uh, online and uh, very often i hear the comment as you know when i'm alone and i'm practicing by myself it sounds so great and then as soon as you are you know next to me i can't play and write notes right, right. and <laughs> in, in a way i guess you know i believe that you know because there's no yeah. uh, pressure right yeah. Um, so when you are alone, you can enter the zone <laughs> of, sure. of possibly, you know, being comfortable and, and create. However, being in front of a camera is a little bit different, right? Because you know that on the other side of the camera, there might be, you know, over southern yeah. people who are watching you. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Um, you know, I mean, one thing is I would say that um, from an early age, maybe from my early teenage years, I remember my dad was always very... Um, he always talked to me about, you know, you got to record yourself a lot so you get comfortable with that. And um, I've done that all of my life, recording myself, uh, video, audio. And I've gotten very comfortable with not really noticing the camera much anymore. I mean, after maybe 20 years of doing it. And I, I, I actually don't really mind the camera that much. I, I, it's pretty easy for me to zone it out, I would say. Um, but at the same time, it is there. I mean, it, you know, there's no denying that. And I think there's there an interesting sci uh, scientific study that was done where they had a person enter a room and tie their shoe, and it took, I don't know, maybe 10 seconds. And then they had the person enter a larger room with 50 people around him and tie the shoe with all 50 watching him. It took the person three times longer. So uh, <laughs> things become very 
difficult when people are watching. <laughs> so uh, it, it was an interesting, uh, interesting thing to look at that something as simple as playing a shoe becomes difficult. So you can only imagine what playing, the, you know, playing a, a piano sonata might might, might uh, become. But uh, like anything, it takes practice. The more that you tie a shoe in front of fifty people, the more it becomes uh, pretty uh, natural. Um, you know, look at any of these, you know, pianists or athletes that are used to performing in big stadiums. Uh, but at the same time, I find it interesting that, you know, talking to, uh, I remember talking to a pianist, Stephen Huff, wonderful pianist, um, one, one of my idols growing up, actually. And I was talking to him about uh, how he gets into the zone for performances. And he said he performs. That's how he gets in the zone. In other words, um, when he has a big performance coming up, like Carnegie Hall, he'll do lots of small performances to, to get used to being in front of people so that by the time he goes to Carnegie, um, you know, it's kind of, he's used to this sensation. But if, if you take two months off from performing in front of people and then you play a concert, that first concert might feel a little, little unusual because you're not used to that extra energy all around you. So the more that you can kind of build up to uh, uh, a big event uh, is preferable, certainly for myself and I think for most other musicians. Um, right. So. so you mentioned a few times your dad and jazz. Um, yeah. What instrument is he playing? Well, so he's an amateur uh, musician. He, mm -hmm. he uh, was professional for a few years in his early 20s, but then he, uh, he went into healthcare. Um, but he used to play uh, the, the saxophone, the, the alto saxophone and tenor saxophone. So he, he, he was, uh, and actually I, I, I also played the saxophone when I was growing up because as a pianist, we don't get to play much like in a band or any of that kind of stuff. You know, when I was in grade school, I wanted to play some music with other people. So to join the band, I had to play some kind of instrument and saxophone made sense to me. Uh, it's a lot of fun to play. It's a lot easier to, than the piano, admittedly. Uh, the fingerings are not as, not as complicated, um, but I really had a lot of fun playing that. And I, I do that in band, jazz band. And, uh, but then when I went to you know, high school, I was about 14 years old is when I, I did shift over to piano uh, primarily, well, exclusively, because I just found it to be more rewarding. Uh, and also, I enjoyed the fact that with piano, you don't really always need a band. You can be alone and you can create wonderful performances uh, harmonically and texturally and you can create an orchestra. So Awesome. Do you still play any saxophone? Or? <laughs> I haven't in years, but uh, I'm, you know, I, I still know the fingerings and I'm, you know, it's a, it's a single reed instrument. So uh, making a sound on the saxophone is actually not very hard. Um, it, it takes a little bit of getting used to, but uh, as far as you know, wind instruments go, it's it's one of the easier ones to just produce a sound on. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I have one in my home in St. Louis, uh, my parents' home. So maybe when I visit them next, I'll uh, try. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it, it would definitely bring back memories. But I, I have no doubt that you know, after a few hours, a person could feel back to where maybe they were. Pick maybe. it up, really? <laughs> well, maybe, yeah. I, I don't know. Give it uh, a try and then <laughs> share it with us. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I will try. I mean, <laughs> yes, I, I'll, I'll do that. That'd be a fun social... <laughs> so, uh, speaking of jazz again, uh, do you improvise? So, I, I have improvised in the past. Um, the, improv the improvisations that I do are a bit more free. Um, they're not as traditional, I would say. Uh, in, uh, they weren't traditional jazz, but... Um, the, improv the improvising that I mainly do, though, um, is actually more along the lines of like maybe composing, where when I'm kind of uh, either transcribing something or writing variations or I'm composing something, I will uh, improvise and try to find the way, the way to go, I, I guess. Um, you know, these days, um, these days my, my time is incredibly taken up by playing other composers' music. And that's, that's, that's more than enough work for me. So that's, that's primarily what I do. But at the same time, uh, I think the spirit of improvisation is something that I'm always trying to uh, capture. I find it remarkable how, you know, with jazz musicians, when they're playing a great one, it really does seem like they're playing. They're not, uh, you know, they're not necessarily always uh, struggling or, 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 you know, these negative type of emotions with the piano. And everything feels spontaneous and free. And I imagine that that's some way, in some ways, the, the way music should always sound, which is uh, a free, spontaneous flow of, of, of messages. And um, that's something that I always try to imbue in my, my classical performances, where um, I want to try to feel like some, you know, a lot of it's improvised, and it's not like I know how the story's going. Because I want to, I want to also be the side. <laughs> 
discovering the story at the same time as the audience. It's sort of a, a, a mutual uh, experience. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with uh, Robert Levin uh, in Boston? Oh, oh, absolutely. Yeah. I'm, I'm a big fan. Um, oh, same here, absolutely. <laughs> I, he, he, um, he, in the tradition of Mozart and Beethoven, he improvises his cadenzas to all the concerti. Also, he does the whole thing where uh, the audience will write down four notes and then he'll improvise a cadenza off four notes that he pulled out of a hat or something. So uh, he's a genius, like, no doubt, in my mind about that. <laughs> you know, I, I wonder how many you know, young pianists, uh, uh, you know, your generation are uh, looking into that kind of uh, performance, sure. you know, to be able to improvise. I remember I, I had a conversation with Robert Levin one time after uh, the concert and we were commenting about improvisations and sometimes you know some people would come to him and say oh Robert your improvisations were uh, not up to a par today or you know I really didn't care for your improvisation yeah and his answer would be oh you don't have to worry about it because you will never hear it again <laughs> so. <laughs> well you know I mean in some ways that's how I feel about some of my you know any, any live performance it's like if someone says that you know it's about a recording of mine or whatever I'm like well, you never have to listen to it again I mean you know I, I mean it's the same answer honestly uh it, it, you know so but um you know and in that same way you know his spirit of kind of just improvising and being in the moment that's that's no different than performing a sonata or something I mean, unless you're going to release it as the definitive recording of, you know, of, of your of your life, where you might want to uh, edit it and all that kind of stuff. But if, if you're just performing a live performance, it's no different than how he feels about his improvisation. So I think it's a very healthy approach, personally. Right, right, right. Yeah. So what's next? You're sitting at home right now, yes. <laughs> practicing. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, practicing, um, you know... Uh, well, also, actually, there's a big acclimation process to this virtual world where I'm learning a lot about uh, video cameras, recording equipment, all this kind of all this kind of stuff that will allow me to actually um, convey what I'm trying to convey virtually. Because if, if I have a, a very bad microphone or very bad video system, it doesn't matter how well I play, no one's going to understand what's going on. So I'm trying also these days to uh, to learn, at, throw myself through like a, like a crash course on video and audio but um yeah I, I have some live streams coming up actually um on june 11th on the violin channel on facebook uh this hasn't i guess been released yet it will be released publicly soon but i'm doing a, like a 30 minute live stream performance from my my home um i'll, I'll be releasing the details on my on my social media on great facebook. i'll share it yeah you, you can share it milana <laughs> um and um yeah certainly uh Aside from that, I, I have some broadcasts planned for primarily uh, focusing on some retirement homes in my community, but everyone's welcome. Uh, these are via YouTube and um, very easy to access. So um, lots of, I guess, virtual um, performances coming up for me and um, just, um, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, definitely share. I'll be happy to share it with our audience as well. Yeah. <clears throat> are you, do you cook? I'm, I'm sorry? Do that? you cook? Oh yes, absolutely. So I, uh, I I have been cooking a lot, and I don't mind that. I I love grilling personally. So I've been grilling a lot of you know steaks, and uh, steaks my, my 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 meat of choice, I would say. So um, when I want you know Whole Foods has got some wonderful meat, so I love shopping there. And um, it, it's weird though these days, you know, wearing a mask and being in lines and all that kind of stuff. But uh, I think that they're being at least in Los Angeles, they're very safe about everything. And, and you're doing a great job. Do, do you live in a high rise or you live in a house? Well, I live in, I, live in a, uh, I guess a high rise. I live on like the third floor, so not uh, not the very top. But um, yeah, I live in an apartment that's um, pretty well, I guess, uh, taken care of. And um, but do do you grill outside or you you? you oh, um, I, I have a little balcony that I that I grill on. So um, yeah. lucky so, you. There yeah, are no yeah. restrictions. Well, um, not that I know of. I, I mean, I I. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm pretty careful about it. It's there's no flammable substance. There's nothing that can catch on fire. Or on my body. So um, a few other people do it as well. So I, I never thought about it being an issue. Um, no, because I, I when I lived in Miami, there there were always rules and regulations. And when we moved to Naples, we also live in high rise, and oh. we were told immediately <laughs> no oh. grilling. Oh, I, I was never told anything, and um, I, the other day my neighbor was also grilling, so I can't imagine it's... Uh, it's, it's Great. 
<laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, but I, I really do it every once in a while. I, I don't I don't grow every night. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, I will at this point I will just uh, unmute everybody and um, or I'll unmute whoever wants to ask a question. So if you could just raise your hand, uh, Greg wants to ask a question. Wait, 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 Greg. <laughs> ah, no! <laughs> Go! <laughs> Dominic, you made reference to, um, you know, you're now into a crash course of audio video, and you also referred to, you know, you were, you've been comfortable in front of the camera for a number of years. Sure. And you have a lot of things out there on social media. Um, in addition to your artistry, uh, you're the one performer that I've noticed is probably the most proficient and engaged on social media and some of the other things you do. I see. Um, and so I'm wondering, um, with students that you work with, how much is it, is it all still about artistry or are you, how are, are you communicating the business of music as it has come to be, uh, come, uh, in addition to the artistry with uh, people you work with? Sure. Well, um, so the students, I do have some students that I'm teaching these days uh, virtually. Um, granted, most of them are in high school area. So uh, the business side of things is not something that maybe is their main focus right now. And I'm, my main focus with them. But certainly when I'm interacting with more <laughs> college level students and students that are really trying to you know, pursue a career in music, um, that is something that I talk to them about a lot. The business side of things is, is, is a different these days, you can't necessarily only play well. You have to play very well. You have to be um, engaging as a person, I would say, um, both online and in real life. Um, I, I think that um, it's very important to embrace the interactions and relationships that you build between uh, audience members and yourself wherever you go. Um, I think the biggest mistake that I see in, in young artists is, it, well, two. One is that they're afraid to share anything on social media. Now, I don't want them to share every single practice video that they ever do because that no one really wants to watch that. But, you know, it, a lot of these performances, like I said earlier, are good enough, at least. I mean, they're more than good enough. I mean, with all my friends, I, I, I go to their recitals and, you know, um, they might say, oh, it was so bad. I'm never going to share this anywhere and that, that whole thing. It's like, no, it, it was actually very nice. At the very least, you could find one minute, one minute clip of it that's good. You, any, you could find that in any um, college recital um, out there. So in, in one way, I, I, I think that they should not be afraid to share things with people online. Uh, on the other side of things, uh, in, in, in real life, uh, they should not be afraid to... Um, you know, interact with people and the big mistake is to perform and walk away and just kind of uh, peace out or whatever from a performance. Uh, that's more of an old school type of way where the performer was this sort of uh, almost, I, I don't know, this, this sacred figure who just kind of came and left. But I think that, you know, attending receptions, uh, really getting to know people and um, yeah, building relationships uh, is very important these days. So um, those are the things that, you know, I, I encourage my students and, well, actually anybody that I talk to, uh, to partake in. I, I always think that if there's an opportunity to, um, you know, go to a reception and, and get to know your audience, that's valuable. You, you learn about, for one thing, you learn about what they like, what they didn't like, perhaps, and that can really tell you a lot more than yourself thinking, oh, I played that, that note wrong. But if someone says, you know, that Beethoven sonata meant a lot to me, you might think about that in a different way um, than, you know, on, on their comments. So it's always an opportunity to learn when you, when you talk with um, people. And for me, I really actually value the fresh ears of audiences and talking to them afterward because I find it really interesting. I hear this music all the time in my practice room on performances. I know how I play it. So when I hear what an audience member thinks, they've heard me once just then. And I find that really interesting to hear their impression and, um, and that is very educational, I think, because almost everyone in my audience is going to hear me for the first time, and they're not going to hear hundreds of hours of practice, and they're not going to hear what I'm trying to do. They're going to hear what I did. So it's uh, a very diff. Those are two things that you can. You, they're very different types of things, I guess. So does that kind of answer your question, or? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, does that being engaging uh, with your listeners does that come naturally to you, or is that something that you've 
work done? Um, well, I would say, you know, it is something that's natural to me. Um, I, maybe I was a, uh, yeah, I, I really enjoy um, engaging in any way with my listeners. For me, I'm someone that, you know, when I'm backstage, for example, of a, of a performance, I like talking to people. I like talking to the, the, the stage crew. I like talking to anybody back there because it makes me feel more human. It makes me open up my expression, um, my communication. When I'm back there quiet and like just kind of like, you know, pacing around, I don't feel like that's the most natural and that's not how I want to be on stage. You know, on stage, I want to be communicating to you just like I'm talking to you right now. And when I start that sort of uh, train of thoughts backstage, uh, talking to anybody, it opens, it opens someone up. And, um, you know, I, I think that's important. So, uh, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I want to make a comment that uh, actually this is an exception <laughs> because majority of the artists want to be there alone, you know, thinking they're very uncomfortable talking before the concert. Uh, you know, so sometimes I encourage our artists to speak to the audience and, and say a few words. And some people are just very uncomfortable speaking because they want to focus on, on what they are about to do. So Dominic, you're an exception. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let's say you're 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 a minority. <laughs> oh. Well, you know, for me, uh, talking to the audience helps me as well because when I'm talking to you, I'm talking about details of the piece. Talking, I'm talking to you about maybe what to listen for. That's also reminding me what I need to do. I mean, if I'm telling you to listen for this or that, I better do that. So <laughs> it also centers me and, and focus. So uh, it, it's a combination. And again, when I talk to people, I, it relaxes me. And it is, it is something I've been doing for, you know, a decade or if not more, um, because most of my audiences that I performed for, you know, my, my youth were at nursing homes, retirement homes, where maybe they'd never even heard um, Beethoven or Mozart before. So I, I had to at least kind of explain, you know, somewhat about what the, what the music was. And also, um, I played a lot of schools uh, in, the, in the area as well, where a lot of these kids, they, they never heard. Actually, I played the Goldberg Variations for 500 kids uh, in a high school um, uh, a few years ago. And um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I had known them from previous visits, so they kind of knew who I was. But I did warn them. I said, you know, you're in for about 50 minutes of Bach right now. And um, yeah, you know, <laughs> you're probably not going to you know, hear this live often. So, uh, But, you know, the kids did, uh, you know, enjoy it because um, you know, it, it is wonderful music. But I think that uh, with any audience, even myself, I mean, I, I know this music pretty well, but when I go to a performance of maybe Jeremy Dank or Stephen Huff and these, these pianists that I admire, when they talk to me, I love it. So I'm only doing what I would want if I was in the audience. Was, so. Do you remember the feedback you got from the school, from the kids? Oh, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the kids, um, well, they liked it a lot. I, I mean, they, um, I, I think what they liked a lot was the fact that, you know, actually the Goldberg variations are long. There's 30 variations. So 30 variations, 50 minutes. You're talking about maybe one to two minutes per variation. So actually, despite its length, you're always changing the mood and the character. So um, there's always something new happening. And I think what they like, maybe they didn't like every single variation. I don't know exactly, but there were probably variations that stuck out to them. And also the other thing I told them to notice for is, again, that, that hand crossing on the piano, you know, they got to see a lot of, a, a lot of this kind of stuff and, and this kind of stuff. And that's something that I think visually can be kind of interesting to see. Um, you don't always see that in many pieces of music. Um, but, you know, again, you know, <clears throat> I find with kids, um, young adults, that when you tell them a time limit, if you say it's gonna be 30 minutes, 40 minutes, 50 minutes, they accept that because every day they go to class, that's an X amount of time. And when they understand that's how long it's gonna be, they accept it and they're ready for it. If I told them it was going to be 10 minutes and it becomes 50 minutes, they would probably get very restless. So, uh, but if, if I prepare them and just tell them that, you know, it's going to be X, Y, you know, X kind of time, they, uh, they're okay with it. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Anybody else has a question? Gala, I, I think you raised your hand. One second. Can you unmute yourself? Yeah. Thank you. My question is, uh, how, does, how do you judge what music the audience will go for? Sure. Um, well, there's a few variables. Uh, 
the easiest way is if I get a concert, I can easily talk to my manager. I can say, hey, you've had artists go there in the past. What's the response? You know, uh, you know, in the past, have our, have the, has the audience been like, we don't like Brahms or we don't like modern music or we don't like, you know, uh, we want a short program or we want this. So oftentimes when I get a concert, the presenter and my manager might give me a little bit of guidance. They might say, you know, this audience, they want exciting music or they want... They want modern music or they want this or that. And that, that'll give me a sort of a, a clue, I would say. Um, that's the easy way of, of putting it. But I also think that at the end of the day, I, I do think I have to be very interested in what I'm doing. If I'm not interested in it, then no one else is going to be. So I do think that if I'm really passionate about a certain topic or idea or theme, that has better hopes of translating to my audience. So my managers always say, they always give me guidelines on what to play, but they always say, you know, if you're really passionate about something, that's what you should do. Um, you know, if, if you're convinced of something, that's what the audience will notice and that's what they will uh, gravitate toward. So um, that's that's usually how I, and, and also again, you know, if I'm gonna play for uh, an audience of, of, of kindergarten kids, that will also educate my, 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 my programming. I might play pictures at an exhibition or something that has pictures and, you know, or little stories or, you know, that kind of stuff um, to, to keep, you know, to keep their attention. And, um, you know, the, the audiences, you know, do vary and the occasion varies too. I mean, if I'm playing, um, um, you know, depending on the time, I mean, you know, these days, for example, I might not play a program that's centered around, um, I, I play more uplifting programs, I would say, these days. You know, Goldberg Variations, uh, music that is is hopeful. Um, I, I think that's something that's needed. So uh, that's also something that educates me in terms of what um, I, I program. Awesome. <clears throat> Anybody else? If you have a question, you can unmute yourself or raise a hand. I'll unmute you. Nobody has any questions. Will, 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 your, will your schedule bring you back to Southwest Florida? Oh, yes. Well, I'm hoping so. Uh, you know, I, I guess we're maybe talking about coming back uh, in the fall or whenever sometime. Uh, yeah, no, know. we we are. Uh, Dominic is going to continue with Beethoven Sonatas, so he'll eventually come back and play that um, as part of the series. Um, at the moment, it looks like we probably, it, it will be next season. We are still talking with Colburn and where it will be. Because the challenge is that there are a lot of kids who are international students. So if they are not back in the United States and they cannot travel safely, uh, we might probably do it at the end of the season, you know, instead of at the beginning. But um, we are having a season. I can assure you about that. <laughs> Well, so I will be performing some more Beethoven for you, and actually some of my very favorite sonatas by him. So, well, now that I know you can do all the other things, Dominic, I'm going to take full advantage of your oh. presence. Oh, sure, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, um, yeah, reach out anytime you want. Uh, um, I, and again, thanks for reaching about this little coffee chat. I've, I've had a, a really nice time, uh, you know, seeing all of you and um, chatting with you and. Phyllis. <laughs> Don't, Phyllis, don't, do you have, sorry, Phyllis, uh, do you have a, a question or you, you were saying goodbye? <laughs> I, I have a question. Mike has a question. Uh, okay. <laughs> One second. Wait, wait, wait. Jim, yes, you'll be right, right there. You'll uh, be next. I think okay. you're next. Okay, Jim, go ahead. My, Mike is going to ask after you. <laughs> uh, Dominic, you, uh, you alluded to your, uh, your composing. Yes. Could you talk a little bit more about that and what... Uh, what style or what what where are you gravitating towards? Sure. So um, I don't do as much composing as I would like, but um, one thing that I I would say that most of my life I have gravitated more toward the style of perhaps um, Prokofiev, uh, sort of a, a neo romantic style, which is uh, driven by harmony, a little bit more um, complicated harmony um, that. Uh, is also uh, so basically I, I enjoy m melodic content but I, I also really enjoy having um, sort of an, uh, a coloration of harmony that uh, can sometimes change the melodies in unexpected ways and I'm also always quite driven to rhythm so I would say a, a composer that I did identify with quite a bit in my youth was Prokofiev uh, the way that he writes beautiful melodies but the undercurrent 
is sometimes very disturbing or very uh, mischievous. Uh, but um, recently, I actually did a, um, a I, I guess I did compose, but I wrote some variations based upon um, a song of Beethoven, actually. Um, the song, um, it, actually, very recently during quarantine, I, I did this project. And I would say in this style, though, I, I, I was trying to sort of enter Beethoven's world, and I was trying to write variations that respected his his style and, and, and didn't interfere with uh, the melody and the content that came originally. So um, I would say that uh, I'm by no means, I don't call myself like a composer. Uh, uh, I wouldn't necessarily always call myself a composer composer, but I enjoy composing for myself. And I sometimes play my transcriptions in, in um, performances. And I think it can vary depending upon the piece that I'm trying to transcribe or write variations to, or if it's a standalone piece, it might be, like I said, a bit more similar to Prokofiev's neo-romantic style. Um, does that sort of answer your question? Okay. Yeah, Michael, you, you had a question? I did. Um, yeah. You talked about um, your programs that you, you put together, but what do you do when uh, Milana calls you and uh, says, um, I want you to do um, the Beethoven sonatas number so and so through, through so and so, and you look and you say, "Gee, you know what? Um, sure, that's, that's something that uh, is I was in our you know in my in my fingers right now. How do you decide whether you want to do that or not?" Well, um, at this point in my life, I'm pretty much uh, saying yes to everything because I I, I love performing, and um, you know I. Unless someone wants, you know, the only thing I'd say no to probably is if someone wants me to do some background music and like a, a dinner party or something. I, I don't play background music. I, yeah. <laughs> but I play, uh, I think it deserves an audience that's going to pay attention and not just eat and, uh, you know, kind of. So if there's an audience involved, I'll say yes, uh, whether it's camera music, soul music, concerto. And, you know, certainly, I mean, when someone asks you to do a few Beethoven sonatas, like, who would say no to that? I mean, this is some of the greatest stuff ever. I mean, uh, every single Beethoven sonata has such a fascinating uh, slot in his life. You know, the first I did the first four sonatas um, in, in Naples. I, I absolutely loved playing those. Those are some that I've been dying to do uh, forever because I love his early life and I love looking at that because we always look at his late or his middle period, not enough at his early period. And um, for example, coming up sometime in this season, I'll be doing uh, some late sonatas of, of Beethoven. Uh, 27 28 and 29 um and so those are some of my favorites so i'm really excited about those as well but um yeah if my manager or milana calls me about a about a concerto or a sonata or, or, or a recital i mean if i've got uh if i've got you know a few weeks i mean i'll say yes or if i maybe if i have less time i'll say yes i uh it has to be something it has to be something pretty uh dramatic i would say like maybe if it was tomorrow and i've never heard the piece before i might say no but um I would, <laughs> you know but uh but who knows i mean if i haven't heard it before and i look at the music and it's not that hard to play you know maybe i'll maybe i'll play it um i would say that uh as of today there's not been many no's in my life uh so as far as what to play and especially again beethoven it's always a yes it has to be a yes <laughs> Uh, his music's too good. Awesome. <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs> Did I notice Daniela uh, wave in there for a second, or was that just... I uh, don't know. Maybe she just said hello. <laughs> oh, I, <laughs> or goodbye. She, well, I think she's here right now. I see her name. <laughs> there she is. She's, she's trying to oh, say something. I think you're muted, Daniela. But we don't hear you, honey. <laughs> I think you're muted right now. Yeah. M maybe it's a better yes. thing that okay. people don't hear what I have to say. <laughs> Welcome, Daniela. Nice to see you. <laughs> Hi, lovely. I, I I tend to hide lately uh, and not turn the screen on because I try to keep multi functioning while sure. still enjoying these coffee hours. And I don't really have a question because you you are wonderfully open about so many things, and we learn so much from you. I think one of the reasons we don't have questions for you is because you oh. just do all. We don't have to ask. Oh but, well, you know, I, <laughs> it's nice of you to say that. <laughs> It's fantastic, but I just wholeheartedly wanted to thank you and Milana again. The tremendous enjoyment to watch these gatherings and everything we'll learn about you guys and your perspectives. And especially, as Greg said, in your case, um, yeah, your conduct with social media and appearances and how 
your approach is just fantastic. I mean, um, it's, it's very refreshing, very refreshing and encouraging to watch. And thank you for doing that and teaching your students to do that and yes. connecting with the audience too. Thank you. Thank you all. It's just, oh. it's, it's turning into my favorite joy. Wednesday afternoon, <laughs> 4 o'clock, and I'm not doing advertisement, I swear. I'm just speaking of it. By the way, I, I am toying with the idea to do a Wednesday mornings. Do I have a hands going yes or no? Is this specific time morning? <laughs> <laughs> no, because I realize that I, I can access the you know people who are in Asia and Europe, so I can actually have <laughs> very interesting uh, people join us if it's um, mm -hmm. earlier in the day. So if I have an audience for eleven a.m., then I will do that. <laughs> Is that a yes? Yes. It doesn't matter. You have my yes. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> I'll keep you guys posted. And I encourage you all to look uh, Dominic's uh, videos on YouTube, explore uh, some of his uh, uh, past recordings. I, if you um, would please subscribe to our YouTube channel, you know, we would greatly appreciate it, you know. Um, Believe it or not, having in, enough subscriptions is a benefit <laughs> to to all of us on, on, on many levels. And uh, so we are climbing up. Diana, yes, you want to say something. Can you unmute yourself, please? Un unmute, unmute, unmute. Um, <clears throat> no, you're still muted. One second. No. Ah. Okay, I'm on mute. Okay, yep. So, um, could you just send me an email with your YouTube name so I can yeah. subscribe? Yeah, absolutely. I will, I will do that. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, thanks for tuning in, everybody. You know, we have a, a, a nice group of, from different uh, parts of the country, and, and it's always wonderful to see you all. Yeah. And, and um, Dominic, you're really, you've been a highlight of my week. <laughs> so. Thanks. I, I appreciate, you know, being invited Thank here. You. Again, you know, for me, it's, it's great to have some social interaction, you know, even virtually with all of you guys. So uh, it brightened my day quite a bit to, to see all of your smiling faces. So, awesome. Thank, thank, thank you. you. All right. Take care, everybody. And stay thank in touch. You. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.